Welcome viewers, we have been joined today by Mr. Andrew Wilkinson, a senior community leader and a former cabinet minister. Welcome Andrew. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Excellent. So, your family moved from Australia to Canada when you were four years old. Yes. Please tell us about your childhood and how did you enjoy growing up in BC? Well, BC was a wonderful place for our family. We arrived from Australia when I was four. I have three older brothers and sisters. And we arrived in Kamloops, and I spent all of my early schooling years there until grade nine, and grew up in Kamloops, which was a wonderful place. And my older brothers and sisters went on to higher education at UBC. It was the only university in the province at that time. And so I was unfortunate that I had to move to Alberta before I could uh, graduate from high school. But BC was a wonderful place for us, and we prospered as we grew up here. Excellent. And what inspired you to become a doctor and a lawyer? Well, I went into medical school as one of my life goals, and uh, partway through medical school I got a scholarship that took me to Britain. And you can't do uh, interchange medical education between Britain and Canada. It doesn't work out because they're different programs. So I could study anything I wanted to, and I thought, well, maybe I'll have a look at law. And so I studied law in England, and then came back and finished off medical school in Canada. Great. And that scholarship was a Rhodes Scholarship, which is a very prestigious one? Yes, it's known as a Rhodes Scholarship. It was set up in about 1901 by a gentleman called Cecil Rhodes, and it provides for about 85 scholars from around the world to go to Oxford University and do a degree. Excellent. So how do you enjoy practicing as a physician? I was a doctor in a number of places in British Columbia. I started off in Camel River, where I spent three summers, and between those summers I spent time in Lillooet and Dees Lake and practiced all around British Columbia. Got to know the place very well. So I have a special kind of connection with northern BC because I lived in Dees Lake. And we always used to joke up there that Terrace and Prince George were in the southern part of BC. <laughs> Great. I read about a story. Uh, you help a child. Dees Lake went with him on a plane. Can you tell us about that? Yes, there were two uh, stories there. One very unfortunate of a 16-year-old young man who was very seriously injured in a motor vehicle accident just outside Dees Lake. And I had to fly with him up to Watson Lake in the Yukon where a jet could come in and pick him up from Vancouver for neurosurgery. And that was a very sad case. And we had to fly up in the dead of night with basically no navigation systems at all. And so that was an interesting but stressful um, encounter. And the second one was a young boy who was about five years old. And he was hit by a tree in a windstorm. And we had to fly him by helicopter south to Terrace. And it was terrible, terrible weather. But we managed to get through safely and he did just fine. Excellent. Thank you for your services there. Absolutely. And how does your knowledge of law help you? Well, I was a lawyer for 25 years and it makes you very capable inside government because you know how things work and it gives you an understanding of how to get things done. And so government has a lot of parallels to what I did. I was a courtroom lawyer and that meant uh, appearing in court and knowing how to deal with arguments and things that come up quickly and on, uh, without expectation of them coming up on your agenda. So in the legislature, that's much of what we do, is to be quick on your feet and to know the answers beforehand and to get in there and argue with the other side. It's much like being in a courtroom. Excellent. And please tell us about your contributions for BC as a deputy minister. Well, I was a deputy minister for almost five years. I was a deputy minister, first of all, in intergovernmental relations. And that was the time when we were building a relationship with the government of Canada after it had been largely dismantled by the NDP under Glenn Clark. And so we managed to get money for things like the Canada Line, for the port strategy that built the Prince Rupert port, for uh, a bunch of health spending that came into British Columbia. So that was a very productive time. And then I moved from that job into the economic development job, where we were very fortunate to have a very growing economy in British Columbia at the time and we're able to invest all over BC in communities through programs run through that ministry. Great, sir. Please also tell us about your contributions as a minister. You have been a minister for a number of ministries. Yes, I was Minister of Technology for about two years, and then Minister of Advanced Education for two and a half years, and then I was briefly the Attorney General. And the most notable thing in Advanced Education was the ability to go around the province of British Columbia and open up new trades training and nursing training facilities. So during my time, we opened up five new nursing buildings and about seven new trades buildings, including the $32 million building in uh, Dawson Creek, just down the road here. Great, thank you. And what do you believe are the major problems of BC presently? Well, British Columbia is an interesting point because we've had a lot of prosperity under the Liberals for about 16 years in a row, 
and now we have an NDP government that is uh, starting to question those things. For instance, the site C Dam may not go ahead because the NDP is having trouble making up its mind whether to go ahead with it or not. We think it was a very good idea for BC. There's also the Kinder Morgan pipeline, which we had a role in approving, but it was mostly a federal decision to approve it. And now the NDP are trying to block that decision, even though they really don't have a basis for doing that. And that would be a major industrial project in British Columbia that may be slowed down by the NDP. So there are a number of issues there. Mostly that's dealing with major projects. But what it's really about is opportunity for British Columbians for making the best and making the most use of their education and skills. And we as a party and I as a person am very dedicated to making sure that people have the opportunities they came here for. My family did very well as immigrants to British Columbia because of the opportunities here. And I want to make sure everybody has those kinds of opportunities. Thank you. And as a community leader of BC, what's in general your vision for BC? Well, I think British Columbia needs to become a very desirable place to do business. We have to make ourselves the fastest and easiest place to set up a business anywhere in the world. Right now that's held by New Zealand and we're about number 22. So we can do much better and catch up with New Zealand and be a place where we can readily do business. The other thing, we have to have a highly skilled and educated workforce. The world is changing all around us. And we know the resource industries here in the peace country are very, very technology intensive. The petroleum, the oil and gas business uses a huge amount of technology. We want to make sure our people are the ones who are benefiting from that and being paid the high wages to use that technology. And how would you like to support the youths? Well, youth to me is critical to the future because as Minister of Advanced Education, I was able to see that the recruitment to higher education was very strong. It needs to be even stronger. We need to make sure that young people feel the opportunity and the goal and the desire to get ahead in life by going and getting higher education. That will make them able to earn a good living in our society. And how would you like to improve further the health care system of BC? Well, health care is something I know quite a lot about, having been a doctor practicing in British Columbia. We spend a very, very large amount of money on health in British Columbia, about $20 billion a year, which is about $4,500 for every single person in the province. And out of that, we get doctor services and some of our um, medications paid for, and of course, all the hospital services. We have to continue to improve that. Right now, access to family doctors is a bit slowed down because family doctors operate as these micro businesses. And we've got to make sure that we have the opportunity for people to get the care they need in a timely way. We should have online bookings. We should have a better system for prescription renewals. We should have the ability to have pharmacists and nurse practitioners do more work so that people can get the care they need when they need it. And how can the issue of shortage of doctors be overcome? Well, interestingly, in the 1990s, well, when the NDP came into office, there were 160 doctors trained every year in BC. They cut that down to 120 for about 10 years. So we lost a group of 400 doctors there that would have been trained if the NDP hadn't cut back the numbers. We came into office in 2001, and as quickly as we could, we increased it to 288 doctors per year. We could still use some more, and there's a, a platform commitment that was made by our party to increase the size of the medical class even further. And how would you like to support the minorities and the Aboriginal communities? Well, minorities and Aboriginal communities are very important in our society. The Aboriginal population is growing much faster than the non-Aboriginal population. And the primary goal there is to make sure that Aboriginal youth are finishing high school and that they're getting into the higher education institutions and completing those courses so that they can have the skills they need to get ahead. That's going very well. That's been growing quickly. And it's because Aboriginal youth are just like other youth. They want to be successful in life. And their parents are seeing that now and encouraging their children to go into higher education, which is a wonderful thing. In terms of minorities, British Columbia is a very, very diverse province, ranging from Vancouver, which is about 50% ethnic Chinese background, through parts of Surrey, which are majority Sikh background, and parts of the suburbs where there are big Korean communities, for instance, and then all through the province where ethnic minorities are represented. We've got to make sure that everybody feels comfortable in British Columbia and can get ahead in life without any worries about where they came from or what they have been in the past. We're worried about who they are today. Thank you. And if you become the Premier of BC for one week, what would you like to do in that week? <laughs> it's tough to get very much done in a week, but there are a few things we would have to do, which is getting our, our attitude to major projects turned around so that British Columbia comes, becomes a place where we can do things more quickly. We need to address housing shortages in Vancouver. We need to address the primary care uh, medicine 
situation in terms of access to family doctors. And we also need to get a much more active approach on opioids and how we can avoid people having overdoses. And what's your plan for the rural communities? Rural communities have special needs and special projects underway. We think of this area of the Peace River, Fort St. John and Dawson Creek and Fort Nelson. They have particular needs because the Peace Country has a big petroleum industry with the gas production being the primary uh, economic driver here. We also have forestry here and a fair amount of farming. And so it's important that those communities feel that the government is working for them, not getting in their way or slowing them down or working against them. And our government has done a good job of that. We need to do even more. The price of uh, petroleum has gone far down in the last five to six years, and yet the industry is doing quite well in the southern Peace region because of the Montanay gas field, which is a very rich gas field. In the northern part of the Peace country around Fort Nelson, things are much tougher because it's what is known as dry gas, and that's not worth as much as it used to be. Thank you. What's your message for the members of our Peace community? Well, to the Peace River communities, I'd just like to say it's great to be here. It's a lovely cold winter weather today, and we've had a great time going down to Dawson Creek and back to Fort St. John, and looking forward to meeting a bunch of people in the community here to talk about my leadership bid. This is a really thriving part of the province, and people here have the right attitude to get ahead in life, and we need to make sure that government stays out of their way so they can get ahead in life. And finally, sir, what's your message for the British Columbians? For British Columbians as a whole, we have to make sure that this remains a land of opportunity where people can get ahead by getting the skills and training they need and where the employers and the investors feel this is a place where they can be successful. Between those two factors, we will make British Columbia a prosperous society forevermore because it's what my family came to, what most of us came to, was a society that was growing and prosperous, and it's our job to make sure it stays that way. Thank you for coming to our program and we wish you all the best. Thank you. Good to meet you. All the very best. Thank you.